Before we get started in the book of Acts, uh, I want to read something. It was actually, if you saw this in this morning's newspaper, um, it was put in there by uh, members of the Jewish community here. Uh, a good reminder. Um, let me just read this. Uh, I, I didn't see the, the if it was a full page ad or not. Uh, Elizabeth just forwarded this to me. Um, October 7th, that's tomorrow, but 2023, last year, internationally denounced terrorist organization Hamas invaded Israel in an unprovoked attack. 1,200 people murdered. More than 800 of them were civilians. Uh, the youngest victim was less than a day old. The oldest was nine, a 91-year-old Holocaust survivor. Citizens of 41 countries murdered or abducted, 251 hostages taken, 43 Americans murdered, 11 Americans taken hostage. Today, those murdered or abducted deserve justice. 101 hostages are still held and unaccounted for. The youngest, Kefir, uh, I don't know how to pronounce it, Kefir Bibas was nine months old. The oldest, Shlomo Mansour, was an 85-year-old survivor of the Holocaust. Seven Americans remain in Hamas captivity. Hmm. Please keep those held in hostage in your prayers. Um, the families of those murdered and those awaiting the return of their loved ones, keep them in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, the Bremen families, the Sassoon Bolig family and G and G Gerson. So uh, when 9/11 hit us back in 2001, uh, the Lord put on my heart Psalm 91:11, a uh, powerful psalm. Um, psalm 10 for 10:7. Um, let me read this. Today is the sixth, and when I get to verses six and seven, it'll be pretty apparent. Why do, you, why do you stand afar off, O Lord? Why do you hide in times of trouble? The wicked in his pride persecutes the poor. Let them be caught in the plots which they have devised. For the wicked boasts of his heart's desire. He blesses the greedy and renounces the Lord. The wicked in his proud countenance does not seek God. Allah is not God, by the way. God is in none of his thoughts. His ways are always prospering. Your judgments are far above, out of his sight. As for all his enemies, he sneers at them. He has said in his heart, this is the enemy, I shall not be moved. I shall never be in adversity. Verse 7, his mouth is full of cursing and deceit and oppression. Under his tongue is trouble and iniquity. And that's exactly what we saw last year on October 7th. He sits in the lurking places of the villages. Hmm. In the secret places, he murders the innocent. His eyes are secretly fixed on the helpless. He lies in wait secretly as a lion in his den. He lies in wait to catch the poor. He catches the poor when he draws him into his net. So he crouches, he lies low, that the helpless may fall by his strength. He has said in his heart, God has forgotten. He hides his face, he will never see. Here's the, what's going on now. Arise, O Lord, O God, lift up your hand. Do not forget the humble. Why do the wicked renounce God? He has said in his heart, you will not require an account. But you have seen, for you, observe trouble and grief to repay it by your hand. The helpless commits himself to you, the Lord. You are the helper of the fatherless. Break the arm of the wicked and the evil man. That's happening in Lebanon right now. Seek out his wickedness until you find none. The Lord is king forever and ever. The nations have perished out of his hand, or out of his land. Lord, you have heard the desire of the humble. You will prepare their heart. You will cause your ear to hear, to do justice to the fatherless and the oppressed, that the man of the earth may oppress no more. 
Let's pray. Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning with open hearts and open Bibles, we pray that you would remind us of your amazing love for us, your amazing love for the people of Israel. They are your chosen people. Most do not know Jesus as Messiah at this time, but we pray, Lord, that you would draw them close to you. We pray, Father, their hearts would be soft, their hearts would be open to Yeshua, Mashiach. Lord, that you would reveal your love, your grace, your sacrifice to all those who need to know that you are the Jewish Messiah, the Messiah of the world. Father, we pray that you would continue to strengthen the hand of the IDF. We pray, Lord, that you would use them as a vessel of honor in your hands to destroy the wicked schemes of the enemy who came to steal, kill, and destroy. And Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit would work in a powerful way, opening up the eyes of those who need to see your love, your grace, your salvation. Father, we pray for those who are still being held in captivity. Nobody knows how many are still alive, but you do. And we pray, Lord, for their deliverance. Lord, we pray for your victory in this area. We know that the enemy wants to destroy, but you came to bring life and that more abundantly. And so, Father, we pray for your will to continually be done there in the nation of Israel. Such a tiny little place, just wanting to be left alone, but Satan wants to destroy them all. And so, Father, whenever Israel retaliates against Iran, whether it's today, tonight, whenever it might be, we pray for your hand to be upon your people and bring a great victory in Jesus' name. And Lord, we know that the time is coming when Ezekiel 38, 39 battle will take place when Israel is living in peace. So we know that's still in the near future. But Lord, I pray that many would be humbled and turn to you now. And as we open up your word, as we look at this section in Acts chapter 8, we pray that we would have ears to hear what your spirit is saying. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Turn with me to Acts chapter 8 as we continue our study through this amazing book that the uh, Dr. Luke wrote, uh, Paul's personal physician. Uh, as we left off, we see that chapter 8 is a church on the move, and, and the reason is because of a great persecution that has come against the Christians, well, they weren't called Christians, but just the Jewish believers in Messiah, Jesus. They were uh, scattered, as we saw last time, by Saul of Tarsus. He was leading uh, this persecution against the church, and God used it to spread the gospel throughout Judea and then into Samaria, and in chapter 10 we'll see it spreads to the Gentiles, so Acts chapter 1 verse 8 is taking place. Uh, specifically, we saw last time how God raised up this uh, simple table waiter named Philip, and he becomes known as Philip the Evangelist. He was a man that was used by God in tremendous ways. He was preaching the gospel, many souls were being saved, uh, he was laying hands on many sick, and they were being healed. Demons were being cast out. We saw how the city of Samaria was filled with great joy as Jesus was touching the hearts and lives of many people. Um, we started looking at the life of Simon the sorcerer. He was a great magician. The word sorcery there is not the typical word for sorcery, which usually means um, witchcraft. It comes from pharmakia. But this is more magic tricks, very skilled in magic tricks. And uh, he, was, he was thinking he was someone special. We saw that many people in Samaria thought he was a, a great man. He was a man of God, and the people were probably worshiping Simon. It looked like he got saved, as we saw last time, because when Philip shows up and he's doing these miraculous things, preaching the gospel, Many were turning away from the trickery of Simon, and they're turning to faith in Jesus Christ, the absolute truth of Christ. Now, as I mentioned last time, it appears on the surface that uh, Simon turns to Christ. He gets baptized, but we saw that his motives are for all the wrong reasons, and we'll see that um, even more profound here this morning when uh, Peter confronts him. We left off with Peter and John coming into Samaria to see what God was doing in the hearts and the lives of these new believers in Christ. The main reason the Lord sends Peter and John into this area was because he wanted to unite 
uh, the Samaritan believers with the Jewish believers. God didn't want two separate churches. There's one body of Christ, um, and it's made up of Jews, Samaritans, Gentiles, all who come to Jesus are one. Anybody struggling with where we stand with the law? And if we are to obey the law, it's written in our hearts, but if we are to live by the law, then just read the book of Galatians. It clears it up pretty well. And Paul, the Hebrew of Hebrews, is the one who wrote it. So God sends these two so-called prof- um, pillars of the church, Peter and John, into Samaria. And remember that Peter was given the keys to the kingdom. What does that refer to? By Jesus. And it's not a literal key, but it's basically just taking the gospel. That would open up doors for salvation. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greeks or us Gentiles. So Peter had the privilege of opening up the door of faith to the Jews on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 Jews get saved. And then we see here, uh, these uh, Samaritans come to Christ, the Spirit will be in them, but then when Peter lays hands on them, the Spirit comes upon them, so he's able to open up that door. In chapter 10, he sent to Cornelius, the first Gentiles, and the same thing. He preaches the gospel, the door is open, and the Gentiles come to faith in Christ. And so, um, we pick up here in chapter 8, we'll back up a little bit to verse 14. And we'll see what uh, happens with Simon the sorcerer here. It says, Now when the apostles who were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent Peter and John to them, who, when they had come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Notice, for as yet he had fallen upon none of them. They had only been baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Again, the Holy Spirit is with everybody in the world. We talked about this back in chapter 1, convicting the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. The Spirit comes in us at the very moment of salvation. The third part of this is that the Holy Spirit then will fill us or come upon us to use us for various activities that He wants us to do. He empowers us to do what He calls us to do. And so the easy way to look at this is um, the Holy Spirit was with the disciples before they get saved, pointing them to Jesus. When Jesus rises from the dead, Jesus in John chapter 20 breathes on them and he says, receive the Holy Spirit. So he comes in them. And then he says, wait in Jerusalem until you're endued with power from on high when the Spirit comes upon them. And now they're speaking in tongues, they're being used in powerful ways to minister to those around them. And so here the Spirit is in them, they're born again, they've been baptized, but yet he has not come upon them at this point. Verse 17 Then they laid hands on them, and they received the Holy Spirit. Again, the fullness, the outflowing of the Spirit. Verse 18, when Simon saw that through the laying on of the apostles' hands, the Holy Spirit was given, he offered them money, saying, Give me this power also, that anyone on whom I lay my hands may receive the Holy Spirit. So can you believe this? He offers Peter and John money because he wanted to learn how to perform signs and wonders. He wanted to pay for the power. Now again, he thought he was somebody very special there in Samaria. He had a big following because of his magic. For thousands of years, magicians would pay a lot of money to learn other magicians' tricks. It was very common, and that's all that Simon was doing. He wanted to pay to learn how to do what Peter and John are doing. But they weren't doing anything. This is not magic tricks. This is the power of the Holy Spirit working in them, working through them. People are getting saved. People are being healed. Demons are being cast out, as we saw back in verse 7. You can't buy the gifts of the Holy Spirit. You can't buy your salvation. This is what 1 Corinthians 12, verse 11 says. But one and the same Spirit, the Holy Spirit, works all these things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. In other words, the Holy Spirit gives you the gifts you need, not what you want necessarily. He gives us what we need. He distributes as He wills. So Simon didn't realize that when we come to Jesus, we have to decrease. Jesus has to increase. That's what John the Baptist said. i got to decrease. It's got to be less of me, more of Him in my life. Simon doesn't understand that. He wanted the power so that he might increase. He wanted people to see how great he was. He really wanted to be somebody special in the church. 
Jesus alone deserves all the praise, all the glory, all the honor. Jesus alone is the one we applaud. He, we, we worship Him. It's all about Jesus. It doesn't matter if you're preaching to two people or 20 or 200 or 2,000. It's all about Jesus. It's never about the instrument. It's about the one who uses the instrument. It's because of this passage of Scripture that we have, and you can all look it up in your iPhone dictionaries, the word simony. Simony simply means the buying and selling of church privileges and offices. And it comes from this scene here in Acts chapter 8. Simony. You, you pay for this privilege of being in ministry. It's a practice that sadly continues. Yes, brother so-and-so just gave $10,000 to the church. Let's make him an elder. That's simony. I've seen it. You've probably seen it. Hey, send in your $1,000 and we'll have our staff pray over you. Or, if you really want to be touched, give $10,000 and Reverend Reginald Ripoff himself will pray for you. I mean, that stuff is happening all the time. You can't pay to get a blessing from God any more than you can pay to get to heaven. Heaven is a free gift to those who receive Christ. He's the one who paid it all in full. He's the one who shed his blood for all of our sins. And how sad it is that during the Dark Ages, this was what made the Catholic Church so wealthy, is they came up with this doctrine that's not biblical, but made them very rich, and it's about getting out of a place that doesn't even exist called purgatory. You would pay indulgences to get grandma out of purgatory sooner. So you'd give the Catholic Church money. This is where indulgences come from. You'd give the Pope money, and then they would say, okay, because of this money, now your grandpa's not going to have to suffer as long in purgatory. Purgatory is not biblical. It doesn't exist. You're either in heaven or you're in hell. You're either in Hades or you're with the Lord. There's no in-between state. And so they were giving money, and that's how they became multi-multi-millionaires. It's the richest church in the world. Kind of a close tie with Mormonism, which is amazing because there's like a billion and a half Catholics in the world. There's about 17 million Mormons, and yet they're about the same wealth-wise. It's just simony. Jesus Christ offers mankind the free gift of salvation. The gifts of the Holy Spirit are free. God's love and grace and mercy and forgiveness are free. You can't buy any of those things with perishable silver and gold from our corrupt lives. And sadly, there's churches, even in our valley, they will have healing classes. Pay us money and we'll teach you how to heal. That's not biblical. That's simony. So be careful. Be wise. Stay in the scriptures. Verse 20. He says, give me, I'll, you know, give me this power. I'll give you money for it. Look at verse 20. Peter said to him, your money perish. Notice that word perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Now, the J.B. Phillips translation simply says, to hell with you and your money. That, that's being pretty frank, isn't it? Peter doesn't hold back here. You know, he says, may your money perish with you. That word perish means to be utterly destroyed. It's the same word used in John 3.16. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, be utterly destroyed, but have everlasting life. We put our faith and trust in Him. You go from utter destruction to everlasting life. And that's what Peter is telling him here. May your money perish with you. You will end up in the lake of fire eventually if you continue to have this kind of a mindset. So it's wrong for anyone to use Jesus as a springboard to fame and fortune. And it's really sad. And I've seen it over the years. Patrick Chuck actually did a video series on this years and years ago. I mean, he'd be astonished today. Whereas a bunch of Christian musicians during the Jesus movement, you know, they would come together and they just, like love song, they just wanted enough money to have enough gas to get to the next place to share about Jesus. It was all about Jesus, singing songs about Jesus. That's all they wanted to do. And then over time, it became a business. And as Chuck is sharing with these first generation Jesus people, musicians, a lot of them are crying because they turned it into a business. He'd be astonished today where some of these guys want $250,000 to show up and do a concert. And, and they're doing many, 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 many concerts throughout the year. It's just unbelievable. What started off as legitimate ministry can become very, very greedy if you're not careful. 
So be careful. We need wisdom. This guy wanted to purchase, you know, a position through money. Peter says, may your money perish with you because you thought that the gift of God could be purchased with money. Verse 21, you have neither part nor portion in this matter. It's another way of saying you don't have any eternal life in you. You have no part in this. For your heart is not right in the sight of God. Again, the Holy Spirit's giving Peter tremendous insight into Simon's heart and into his motives. You have no part or portion in this matter. You're not in fellowship with the Lord. You don't have the Holy Spirit with you or in you. You think you can buy him with your rotten money? You are mistaken. Verse 22, here's the flip side. Peter tells him, Repent, therefore, of this your wickedness, and pray, God, if perhaps the thought of your heart may be forgiven you. So even as Peter is blasting him with the truth about his wicked heart, we see here that God's grace is still evident. He gives him a way out of his wickedness. Repent. And that's true for anybody in here. If you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, it doesn't matter what you've done or how many sins you've committed, you repent. You turn away from doing those things. You turn to the Lord and you will receive eternal life. You will be forgiven of all of your sins. It's so true for all of us. And here's a great example of this. Here's a way out. You know, the same Peter is the one who writes in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 9, It says, the Lord is not slack or slow concerning his promise, as some count slowness or slackness, but is long-suffering, that means patient, toward us. Here's his heart, not willing or not desiring that any should perish. There's the same word. He doesn't want you to perish. He doesn't want you to be lost. But that all should come to repentance. Jesus died for you. He he shed his blood for your sins. You don't have to perish. You don't have to be lost. He wants to bring you into the kingdom of God. The Bible is very clear about this. And so if you don't know Christ, if you're walking in sin, then you need to repent. You need to get back into a close relationship with him. That's all he desires. That's why he came from heaven to earth, to give us a close, intimate relationship with him. Now look at verse 23. Peter goes on to say, For I see that you are poisoned by bitterness and bound by iniquity. And that's exactly what bitterness does. It binds people's hearts. It it, um, poisons the soul. Hebrews 12.5 says a, a root of bitterness can spring up and cause trouble and defile many. Ephesians 4.31 says, Let all bitterness and wrath be put away from you. It's a sign. If you're a believer and you've got bitterness, it's a sign that you're quenching or grieving the Spirit. He doesn't want you to be bitter. He doesn't want you to have anger, animosity towards those around you. He wants you to walk in love. The world's going to know we're His disciples by the love we have for one another, not by the bitterness. If you're walking in bitterness, you need to repent. I'm not saying you're not saved, but you're quenching the Spirit if you are saved. Verse 24, now notice what Simon does here. Simon answered and said, pray to the Lord for me. That's a lot of people still do. Praying to Peter? Peter, you pray for me. No. Pray to the Lord for me that none of the things which you have spoken may come upon me. You know, a sinner who wants salvation, but they're not willing to pray themselves and ask Jesus to come into their lives themselves, they're not saved. I can't pray for anybody to go to heaven. I can pray for you. But only you can make that decision to receive Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior. I can't do that for you. Nobody can. God wants you and Jesus face to face. There's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Not Peter, not anybody else. Nobody can go to heaven because their spouse is saved or their parents were born again. Each of us must make that personal decision to ask Christ to come into our lives, forgive us of all of our sins, and be our Lord and Savior. When you do, you will experience incredible joy. That's what we see throughout Acts. When the gospel comes, people are rejoicing when they're a new creation in Christ. Their sin is gone. You know, when I got saved, I mean, walking forward to receive Christ, I mean, I literally felt like I was three feet off the ground. I wasn't, but I felt all this weight of the sin I've been committing and living in just coming, it was just like melting away. 
And it was just all the Lord just taking it away and just being that new creation in His sight, in His presence, a new creation in Christ. You end up with peace with God. You uh, have the peace of God in you. you. You receive His unconditional love, His indescribable joy, as the Bible talks about. God gives us that blessed assurance that we are now His. We are a child of God. Um, that's our future hope, being with Jesus in heaven. Look at verse 25. That's all we hear. We don't know. Did Simon repent? Did he get saved? I don't know. It doesn't tell us. But look in verse 25. So when they had testified, talking about Peter and John, and preached the word of the Lord, they returned to Jerusalem, preaching the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. So again, we're not told what happened to Simon the sorcerer. Uh, did he come to the Lord? Did he repent? We have no idea. If you look at some of the history books, some of the early church fathers, they said that Simon actually was one of the main culprits in starting Gnosticism, which is a cult. It's a false belief. There's no such thing as Christian Gnosticism. That's pagan. So Gnosticism, I came out of Christian science, which is basically a form of Gnosticism. Everything material is evil. Everything spiritual is good. That's what Gnosticism teaches. You have to get this higher plane of knowledge, and then you can get saved. All the rest of us dummies will never make it. But if you have this super knowledge, you know, that's Gnosticism. So everything evil, that's material. Is that right? No. No, even the money in your wallet's neither good or bad. It's what you do with it. This, cre this creation, this material, God created it. He said it's very good. So it's not everything material is evil. Is everything spiritual good? Not if you've run across any demons in your life. They're spiritual. They're not good. And so Gnosticism is so evil, it's so wrong. And maybe he did, it was part of that, I don't know. But that's what history says. But now here we see Peter and John, they're traveling back to Jerusalem. But as they go, they're stopping in all these villages looking for opportunities to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ throughout Samaria. But now, this is what I love. This is now this other guy. What a contrast. We're being introduced to this guy named, uh, well, I don't know what his name is. The Ethiopian eunuch. <laughs> How would you like to have that on the back of your jersey as a football player? I'm the Ethiopian eunuch. Well, that, that wouldn't be very good. Anyway. Simon sought the Lord for all the wrong reasons, but here we find a sincere seeker, and that's the name of the, the title for this, uh, this message is a sincere seeker, because he was. He was sincerely seeking the Lord. And when someone seeks, according to Jesus, they will find, verse 26, if they're sincere. Now, an angel of the Lord. Again, we don't know who this is. We'll just call him Bob. He shows up, this angel, random angel, spoke to Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south along the road which goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. This is desert. I don't like to hear the name Gaza anymore. I mean, it's an actual place. It's been around for thousands of years. Uh, it was a place for the Philistines. There was one of their main cities, Ashdod, Gaza, and the rest of them. Escal et Never mind. Anyway, I'm not going to try to remember the five names of the pagan cities. But Gaza, we all know about it. Unfortunately, it's in the news a lot. Uh, it's so sad because we as a nation have given billions to the people of Gaza. The world is giving many, many more billions of dollars to Gaza. It should have been one of the most beautiful places on the Mediterranean Sea. It sits right on the Mediterranean. It's a beautiful coastline. It could be like Tel Aviv. It could be like so many other places. What do they do with it? 300 miles of tunnels under a little tiny piece of land, bringing in weapons from Egypt to destroy the Israelites, the Jewish people. Horrible. Be that as it may, here we see Philip. He leaves revival in Samaria. Because the angel says, go down to Gaza, to this desert. So he's traveling from Samaria. It's about 70 miles to Gaza. Not that far. It's like from here to the other side of Montrose. And just wait there for further instructions. Got to ever do that with you? Jeff, I want you to do this. My answer is usually, why? <laughs> 
I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Lord. It doesn't make any sense to me at all. I don't know what you're saying. i got to pray about more. No. When God tells you and you know it's the Lord from his words, then just do it. So he says, okay, just go down there. Wait there. So step one, he has to go. Now, the reason this is so amazing to me is he's seeing hundreds, if not thousands, of Samaritans coming to Christ. He's being used to heal people, cast out demons. Why would you leave that and go out and stand in the middle of nowhere? Because that's what it was, middle of nothing there. And yet in obedience, because it's not about Philip, it was all about Jesus. And Philip knew that. Okay, Lord, whatever you want me to do, I'm gung-ho, I'm going to do it. So he goes down there, and he waits, and it doesn't take very long, but the Lord's going to do something amazing here. Verse 27. So he arose and went, and behold, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, the queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasury, and had come to Jerusalem to worship. So this guy's very, very influential. You know, he's like second in command under Candace the Queen. He's, she's in char- he's in charge of all of the money of the Ethiopians. There's a strong Jewish presence that has been for thousands of years in Ethiopia. And so he's probably going up there just to worship the Lord, maybe one of the feast days. He's in Jerusalem, it says, to worship. He's returning and sitting in his chariot. He was reading Isaiah the prophet. I mean, isn't this amazing? That God is not only concerned about the hundreds, if not thousands in Samaria, he's concerned about this one Ethiopian guy. He's got a heart for this one guy. God tells Philip, stop what you're doing there in Samaria. Go down to the desert. There's a guy from Africa that I want you to minister to. And so in God's eyes, this guy is just as important as anybody else. You're just as important to God as anybody else. You might think, I'm just a speck of nothing in the middle of a giant universe. No, God loves you. He is concerned about you. He cares about your soul. God is, you know, might seem like he's a billion light years away, but no, he loves you. He is right here, and he's knocking on the door of your heart. Yes, this universe is expansive, but God is bigger still. The wonderful thing is God sees your heart. He knows the damage that's in your heart. He knows the confusion that's there. He wants to fill that emptiness, not with religion, but with Jesus Christ, the only one who can breathe life into you once again. God is not distant. In fact, Jesus is standing at the door of your heart. Look at this verse in Revelation 3.20. It's not just for the last day's church of Laodicea. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But then he says, If anyone, and that's in the singular, if anyone, any person, any single one of you hears my voice and opens the door, you open the door of your heart, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In other words, I will save you if you hear me knocking on the door of your heart. This whole scene was such a setup by God because here's his influential Ethiopian eunuch making this long trek back from Jerusalem back to Ethiopia. He's there to worship the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He was probably, you know, a proselyte Jew at some point, and maybe during one of the feast days he's there to worship God. And now he finds himself in a chariot, probably with a big entourage of people traveling back because he's an important guy. And he's out in the middle of nowhere as well. But notice he's reading, this would be the scroll of Isaiah. If you ever seen the scroll of Isaiah, the great scroll of Isaiah they found in the Dead Sea Scrolls, is 25 feet long. It's in the, uh, the, the what do they call it, museum there? Shrine of the Book in there in Jerusalem. And, and it's kind of gotten yellow. Uh, years ago, we had the actual um, photo, what do you call it, it's facsimile of that great scroll of Isaiah here. It's 25 feet long. I mean, almost the whole stage. And so they, and they would always be rolled up in a scroll, And so he's in Isaiah 53, as we'll see. They didn't have chapters and verses, so they're going from right to left when they're reading. So we spin it this way. You get all the way to Isaiah 53. So he's probably leaving Jerusalem. He's out there by Gaza. He's already read through a lot of Isaiah, and he comes to chapter 53. And that's when the Holy Spirit's going to tell Philip, go up and catch up to this guy. I mean, this is just amazing. That's the next instruction. Okay, I told you to go out here. Now, since you're waiting here, Look at verse 29. Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go near and overtake this chariot. So Philip ran to him and heard him reading the prophet Isaiah and said, 
So Philip asked him, do you understand what you're reading? And he said, how can I unless someone guides me? And he asked Philip to come up and sit with him. That's an open door. You know, I'm reading this scroll of Isaiah and I really don't know what it means. I mean, this shows us that a person can read the Bible and not have any idea what it means. I read the Bible when I was in a cult for many, many years. It made no sense because you have blinders on. You can't see what the Word of God says. It makes no sense because it's only opened up by the Holy Spirit. If you don't have the Holy Spirit, you won't understand it. I mentioned first service, one, my best friend out in San Diego, a guy named Rob, um, his dad started the San Diego School um, San Diego School of Law, I think it was called. It's a famous law school there, downtown San Diego. His dad was brilliant, really neat guy, um, but he didn't know the Lord. But he'd read through the Bible two or three times. And I was talking to him. I got saved. I'm a young punk, and I don't know nothing. You know, he's this brilliant guy. He knows all about the law and everything else. And so um, he's talking about it. He goes, yeah, I've read through it. Do you understand? Do you need Jesus? Nah, it didn't mean anything to him. It was just a historical book. And it was so sad because Rob and I, we prayed for his dad a lot. And when his dad was, I think he lived to be 92. I think when he was 90, he got saved. Rob was able to lead him to the Lord. It was, it was awesome. But without the Holy Spirit, without being born again, you can make the Bible say whatever you want. That's why these cults come up with all these different weird ideas about Jesus, about God, about salvation, about what you need to do. You know, the Christians actually have to go back and keep the law. No, that's not what the Bible teaches. We have the law fulfilled in our hearts. Jesus is written in our hearts. Are we lawless? No, but the law has been written in our hearts. Now we walk in the Spirit. That's why I said Galatians is so important, because when you go through Galatians, he says there, Galatians chapter 3, around verse 27, he says, um, the law is a tutor to bring us to Christ. So the law is an instructor to bring us to Christ. And once you come to Christ... You're no longer under the tutor. You're no longer under the law. That's why we are free in Jesus. It's so freeing. So this guy, he's reading Isaiah, but it makes no sense to him at all. But look at verse 31 again. He says, how can I? How can I understand this unless someone guides me? This is good because it shows the humble heart of this Ethiopian. I don't get it. Can you explain it to me? How different from so many non-believers. The Holy Spirit is our guide. He's our teacher. Jesus says He will teach you all things. The Holy Spirit's the one that opens up the Word of God to us. The Jews have the Old Testament. Jesus is throughout the Old Testament, but they have blinders on their eyes. They don't see who Jesus is for the most part. This is what Jesus says in John 5, 37. And the Father himself who sent me has testified of me. You have neither heard his voice at any time nor seen his form. He's speaking to the religious leaders in Israel. But you do not have his word abiding in you because whom you sent, he sent, the Father, him, Jesus, you do not believe. You search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And these are they which testify of me. Again, the whole Old Testament is about Jesus. But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. They were so caught up in keeping all the rules, rituals, and regulations of the law, they didn't see Jesus. They didn't see their Messiah was right there with them. So sad. So sad. So here, it's all a great setup by God, bringing out Philip from the revival, standing in the desert. Here comes the Ethiopian eunuch, happen, happens to be reading from Isaiah 53. I don't believe there's any coincidences in life. I like to call them God incidences. This is a God incident. And so, look at verse 32. The place in the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter. And as a lamb before it shears is silent, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his justice was taken away. And who will declare his generation? For his life is taken from the earth. What a beautiful section there in Isaiah 53. So the eunuch answered Philip and said, I ask you, of whom does the prophet say this? Of himself? 
I mean, is Isaiah writing about himself or of some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth. It's like ding, 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 light bulb comes, light bulb comes on. It's like, this was an open door to preach the gospel. <laughs> Who is this? The prophet Isaiah or is this somebody else? So beginning at this scripture, preach Jesus to him. And again, I'm sure he went through all kinds of verses. He could have just started scrolling backwards into there. Isaiah 7, 14. The virgin will conceive and give birth. That's Jesus. Isaiah 9, 6. Unto us uh, a child is unto us a child is born. Unto us a son is given. And he'll be called Wonderful, Counselor, Almighty God, Prince of Peace. The government will be upon his shoulders. It's all about Jesus. You go through Isaiah, you go through the Old Testament, it's all about Jesus. In fact, look at these verses in Isaiah, chapter 53, verses 4 through 6. Isaiah prophesies, surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. I'm sure Philip gave him these scriptures because this is the scriptures immediately before the ones he just read. He carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded, that means pierced through, for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. That speaks of the crucifixion of Christ as clearly as you could state it. He died for our sins. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. In other words, the punishment we deserve for sin, he took it upon himself so that now we can have peace with God because he was chastised in our place, tortured, beaten in our place. Isaiah goes on to say, and by his stripes we are healed. All we including you and me, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, but the Lord Yahweh has laid on him, Jesus, the iniquity of us all. So you can't get any clear picture of Jesus there in Isaiah 53. Who's this speaking of? Isaiah or somebody else? Somebody else. Let me explain Jesus to you. And so as he is proclaiming who Jesus is, this eunuch's heart is being touched, being changed. He's being convicted by the Holy Spirit. He realizes now his eyes are being opened and he sees who Christ is. It's awesome. I think this is when he becomes born again. Once again, Romans 10, 17 says, So then faith comes by hearing and hearing from the word of God, hearing by the word of God. This sincere seeker, he's found what he's been looking for. A personal relationship with the creator of the universe. He didn't find religion because he already had that. He didn't find some organization. He didn't need that. He didn't find a bunch of rules and rituals, but a personal relationship with God through Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible is all about. The Bible is not about a bunch of do's and don'ts and what we should do and shouldn't do. The Bible is all about coming back into a relationship with the creator. It started when Adam was created by God. God created him. He created Eve for fellowship. That's what it was all about. It says he came in the cool of the evening just to hang out with his creation. And then they sinned. They rebelled against God. They ate of the forbidden fruit. Sin enters into the world. But the whole Bible is about God reconciling us back to himself, back into a relationship with the Lord. 1 John chapter 1, the same apostle John is now... You know, he's probably in his 90s when he writes this. And this is what he reiterates in 1 John 1, starting in verse 1. That which is from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon and our hands have handled concerning the word of life. He, what he's talking about is Jesus. I was there for three and a half years. I walked around with him. I got to hang out with him. I got to eat meals with him. I got to watch him do all these miraculous things, feeding the multitudes, healing the, you know, cleansing lepers, opening blind eyes. I was there. I touched him, he says. My eyes saw him. It's all about the word of life. And he says in verse 2, the life was manifested, revealed, and we have seen and bear witness and declare to you that eternal life which was with the Father and was manifested to us, that which, we, you have, ah, that which we have seen and heard, we declare to you that you also may have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. That's the whole reason Jesus came, was to bring us back into fellowship with the Creator of the universe. We're going to take communion here in a little bit, 
Communion means fellowship. And, and Jesus established that by going to the cross, paying the price in full for all of our sins. Look at verse 36. So he's opened up his heart. He's received Christ. Now as they went down the road, they came to some water. Here again, they're out in the middle of a desert. This is just like God. And eunuch said, see, here's water. What hinders me from being baptized? Again, baptism is identifying yourself with Jesus in his death. You go under the water, come up, you raise up a new creation. It's identifying with Jesus in his death, burial, resurrection. I'm identifying with Jesus. I'm not ashamed of Christ. So he's like, hey, let's do this. I mean, this guy's excited. Then Philip said, verse 37, if you believe with all your heart, you may. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. I love it. He just wants to, you know, bear the old man. He wants to put his faith and trust fully in Christ. He's, he's asking, what do I have to do to be saved? Believe in Jesus. Remember when the Philippian jailer runs to Paul and Silas, and he's about to kill himself. That's how desperate he was. He was ready to commit suicide. I've known a lot of people ready on the verge of committing suicide. Why do I want to keep living in this stinking world? It's horrible. And this guy's ready to kill himself. And Paul says, do yourself no harm. We're all right here. You know, nobody's escaped. You don't have to kill yourself. Nobody's going to run off. And then he says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? Believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved. That's all you can do. Put your faith and trust in him alone. The crowds of people asked Jesus that towards the beginning of his ministry. They wanted to know, what do we have to do? What good works? How do we keep the law? What, what do we have to do to be saved? That's what they're asking. What good works do we have to do to do the works of God? Here's Jesus' answer, John 6, 29. Jesus answered and said, this is the work of God. This is the only thing you can do. The only thing God requires, believe in him whom the Father sent. Believe in Jesus whom the Father sent believe. It's not an intellectual belief. Oh, I believe he's a historical figure from 2,000 years ago. Believe is an active word. You have to put your faith, your trust in him alone for your salvation. That's what it means to believe. Not just saying, oh, I believe in Jesus. Guess what? James says the demons believe. Where are they going to spend eternity? In the lake of fire. So it means to put your faith alone in Christ alone. Receive him as your Lord, as your master, as your savior. You're literally believing that He is your only hope for salvation. He's your only hope of having your sins forgiven and washed away. The Apostle John also writes this in John 1.12, But as many as received Him, to them He gave the right to become children of God, to those who believe in His name. Again, it's a choice we all must make. Nobody can save themselves. Nobody can go to heaven on their own. You need to receive and believe in Christ as your Lord and Savior. He's done everything to provide you with everlasting life. He came, he lived a perfect life. He was born sinless. That's why you needed the virgin birth. No sin in him. So he had to die as the only perfect sacrificial lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. The Jews had slaughtered literally millions of animals over the years. Millions of sheep were slaughtered every year for sin. It was a temporary covering for sin. That's what God desired. But Jesus was sent as the ultimate final sacrifice for the sins of the world. That's why there's no sacrifices going on today. Jesus paid the price in full. Verse 38, so he commanded, there's the eunuch saying, he commands a chariot to stand still and both Philip and the eunuch went down into the water and he baptized him. I love it. It's just like, let's do it. So they get baptized. Now, here's an interesting verse. When they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord caught Philip away, so the eunuch saw him no more, and he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotus. And passing through, he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. So the thing is that Azotus is 20 miles away from Gaza. And so he comes up out of the water, and the eunuch saw him no more because he was caught away. What's the word there? Harpazo. Snatched away. That's an amazing way to travel. You know, 
instead of having to walk 20 miles, the Lord says, you've been out here a long time, standing in the desert, let's just, boop, instantly he's traveling 20 miles, instant. He comes up out of the water, boom, he's there in Azotus. That's the rapture, a little preview, because it's the exact same word, harpazo, that's used in 1 Thessalonians 4.16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up, harpazo, caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Thus we shall always be with the Lord. How fast does that happen in 1 Corinthians 15? In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, we're going to be changed. So he got a little preview action on the rapture here. He's part of the dead in Christ now. He'll rise first. But he got to experience this amazing, I don't know what you would call it, just a instant travel. I want to sign up for that travel plan. That's pretty cool. But the Ethiopian finds himself all alone. He's in the water, probably dripping wet. Wow, where did he go? But then he goes his way, it says, rejoicing in verse in the verse 39. He's a new creation in Christ. He knew I'm never alone anymore. I've experienced the greatest thing of all, the free gift of salvation. It doesn't come through keeping the law. I tried it. I don't understand it, he says. I, I was trying to keep the law. Nobody can keep it. The Bible wasn't given to us. The law wasn't given to us to make us righteous. It was given to show us how unrighteous we are. Romans 3.20 says that, you know, we come to Christ because the law brings us to the end of ourselves. The law shows us that we are sinners. The law shows us that we need the Messiah, Jesus. And then as he preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. Caesarea, what a, one of my favorite places to go in Israel. It's right on the coast there. This is where Paul would be in prison for two years. We'll see that later in Acts. But the cool thing is we're going to see Philip in Caesarea later. Much later. Years and years later, he's there in Caesarea. He's got four daughters. It says they're all virgins. They're all prophetesses. And Paul, when he's arrested, comes to Philip and he gets to hang out with Philip. What an amazing conversation that was be, that would be. Why was Philip in Samaria? Because Saul of Tarsus, Paul persecuted him, persecuted the church, and they drove him out. And now years later, they're reconciled. Don't ever think that that person that treated you horribly, maybe somebody in your life that has been very, very mean to you, can't get saved. God can save him. He saved Paul. He saved me. He saved so many of us that had such a weird attitude, had bitterness and anger. And I'm sure there's a lot of people that said, Paul can never get saved, but God says, yes, I can do it. You might be thinking of somebody right now. Even as we go to communion now, maybe there's somebody in your life that's made your life very difficult. Pray for them. Use this as an opportunity because you want to see them come into fellowship with Jesus. Communion, as you know, it celebrates the fact that all of our sins have been forgiven. Your price is paid in full. That's why Jesus said, come to me, all you who labor, and are heavy laden, and he's referring to those who are trying their hardest to keep the law. He says, come to me, all you who labor. You're heavy laden. Why? Because you can't keep it. It's going to drown you. But come to me, and I will give you rest. It's all fulfilled in Jesus. There's no balance due. Jesus has declared us righteous. We are redeemed by his blood. And so we celebrate communion, knowing that all of our sins have been redeemed have been forgiven let me just mention one more thing about this before we take communion if you're in a season of life that you're going through a trial or going through a difficult time this is a great time just to go before the lord because communion means fellowship and just be reminded that jesus not only died for all your sins he rose from the dead and he says, I'll never leave you. I'll never forsake you. Whatever you're going through right now, he's going through it with you. And he wants you to look to him. He didn't say, okay, just suck it up, pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. I'll see you on the other side. No, he's going to walk through this life with you. No matter how hard, no matter how difficult, no matter how trying it might be, Jesus is with us to the end of this age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, 
As we come before you, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your mercy. We thank you for this time together in your word. We thank you, Lord, that we can partake in communion, fellowship, together as a body of believers, but most importantly, with you, our Lord and Savior. Lord, thank you for opening up our eyes to see our need for Jesus. And we thank you, Jesus, that you are the one and only genuine Messiah. We thank you, Lord, that life is found only in you. And when we gave you our lives, when we surrendered to you, that is when we experienced forgiveness, freedom, peace, and joy. We were transferred from the domain of darkness. We've been brought into the kingdom of light, the kingdom of your beloved Son. We went from damnation and death into everlasting light and life. And so, Lord, we thank you for all that you've done in our lives. And may we take communion with a joyful heart this morning. And if there's someone here that has not given their life to you, uh, you don't want them taking communion because we acknowledge in communion your death for our sins. Your blood was shed for our sins. And if we don't believe and trust you, then why would we partake? And so for all of those who have not received Jesus, then don't partake. Or right now, you can open up your heart and ask Jesus to fill you with his spirit to save you from your sins, to wash your sins away. And if you will come to Christ right now, then you can experience true fellowship, true communion with the Lord from this day forward. And then we encourage you to take communion with us. All you need to do is say, Lord Jesus, I recognize I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. I know the wages of sin is death. But Lord, the free gift of God is eternal life in you. And so Lord, I humble myself before you. I turn from my sin. I turn to you right now. I ask you to come into my life. I receive you as my Lord and Savior and I thank you that you can forgive me and wash me clean and make me a new creation in Christ. And it's by the faith that you've given me that I put my trust in you right now. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen.